Oof, my stomach hurts. Ow. Hey, you know that's not your stomach, right? What are you talking about? I know what my stomach is, and it hurts really bad. That's definitely not your stomach. That's where your intestines are. W wait, you don't know your digestive anatomy? How would I know my digestive anatomy? You haven't taught us that yet. Oh, I'm excited because I made a whole video about it, and I really like talking about it. Oh, I should probably go to the bathroom first, but... All right, let's do the lesson, I guess. Let's jump to the whiteboard. So let's start at the beginning. We eat food, we put that food into our mouth or our oral cavity. Now connected to the oral cavity, I've got these three glands in yellow. These are called the salivary glands, and they're gonna produce enzymes which help us break down the food that we start chewing in our mouth. There's three salivary glands in total. We have the parotid gland right here. We have the submandibular gland because it's sort of under your mandible or under your jawbone. And then the sublingual gland, which is under your tongue, hence the term sublingual, under the tongue. But all three of those glands produce our saliva, so we call them the salivary glands. Now connected to the oral cavity, we have our throat, and our throat connects to our esophagus, and that's where food is gonna travel after we swallow our food. It's gonna take that food from our oral cavity or our mouth all the way down to our stomach, which as you saw in the intro is not in your belly. If you wanna find your stomach on your body, just put your hand underneath your ribs on the left side, and that's kinda of where your stomach is, up in there. So just inferior to the esophagus then is the stomach. Food will travel down the esophagus into the stomach where it's gonna undergo a bunch more digestion because the stomach's got muscle that's gonna squeeze on the food as well as a bunch of acid to help break down some of the food as well. But we also wanna be able to control where food goes and where it doesn't and where that stomach acid goes and doesn't. And so one of the things that we have in order to prevent things from going where they're not supposed to are these little tiny muscles called sphincters. Sphincters are circular muscles and they work to close off parts of the digestive system whenever we don't want something to pass back and forth. We've got two in the esophagus, one on the top and one on the bottom. The one on the top is called the upper esophageal sphincter and the one on the bottom of the esophagus is called the lower esophageal sphincter. These two sphincters are really important because they prevent acid from your stomach from going up into your esophagus and then up into your oral cavity. If that acid gets up into your esophagus or oral cavity, it'll start to burn. We call that acid reflux or heartburn, which has nothing to do with your heart. But those sphincters prevent that acid from traveling up the wrong way. Then on the other end of the stomach, we have something called the pyloric sphincter. And the reason we need this is because we want food to stay in the stomach for long enough to undergo proper digestion before it goes into the intestines. So that pyloric sphincter will be closed off until we're ready for that food to go from the stomach into the intestine, in which case that muscle will relax, open up, and the food can pass through. And from the stomach, it's gonna travel into the first part of the small intestine, which we call the duodenum, or sometimes called duodenum. I've heard it pronounced both ways. So that duodenum is that little curved section that's the beginning of our small intestine. And actually a lot more digestion happens in the duodenum of the small intestine. And we'll come back to that in a minute once we see some other organs that food doesn't pass through. We'll come back to it. Next up, we're gonna go through the rest of the small intestine. And if you notice, the rest of the small intestine is gonna wrap around, it's gonna like a bunch of squiggles. There's a reason that we're trying to maximize the time that the food is in the small intestine. That's because we're gonna be absorbing nutrients out of the small intestine into the bloodstream. And we wanna have plenty of opportunity. We don't wanna waste any nutrients. So we have this long curvy small intestine so that food stays in the small intestine a long time so we can absorb every nutrient that we can from our food. So at this point, we've traveled through the small intestine, we've reached the end of it, and we're ready to move into the large intestine. The large intestine isn't called large intestine because it's longer, it's actually shorter than the small intestine, but it's bigger around, it's larger, and so we call it the large intestine. But it also has another name, and that other name is the colon. So anytime you hear colon or large intestine, it's exactly the same thing. They're synonyms of each other. You can call it whichever one you want. They both mean the same thing. Colon, large intestine, one and the same. So at this point, we've absorbed all those nutrients out of the food. We've entered into the large intestine, but you'll notice this little dangly thing hanging off the bottom of the large intestine, and that's called the appendix. The appendix for a long time we thought was just a pointless organ left over from our evolution, but we think now it probably acts as a, as a reservoir for our gut bacteria, so that whenever we have like diarrhea and stuff and we gotta flush out the contents of our large intestine, we keep some of that good gut bacteria in our appendix to repopulate our large intestine after that's happened. Now the colon has a bunch of different parts. This bottom part right here that connects to the small intestine we call the cecum. From there, the remnants of our food are gonna travel upwards, so we call this part the ascending colon. Then the food's gonna travel across the body, and so we call that the transverse colon. 
And then to bring the food back down, we're gonna have the descending colon. So again, the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon. Now towards the end of the colon, it makes a sort of S shape. If you use your imagination a little bit, um, right here, it kind of curves one way and it curves back the other way. And so that part where it makes that sort of S curve, we call that the sigmoid colon. Sigmoid just means S shaped. So one more time, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and then sigmoid colon. And the purpose of the colon is to absorb water out of our food. We absorbed all the nutrients out through the small intestine into the bloodstream. And then from the large intestine, we're absorbing all the water out into the bloodstream. So both of these intestines are gonna have lots of blood vessels going to them because we're getting all these nutrients and water from our food that's gonna go directly into the bloodstream. So there'd be a lot of blood vessels all throughout these intestines. So we've kind of reached the end of our digestive tract now. We've got a couple more structures, the first of which is the rectum. The rectum is gonna be where our feces is stored before it's ready to exit the body. And finally, the anus, which is the hole through which our feces will travel whenever we poop. <laughs> <laughs> now we really wanna be able to control when we poop. So we've got two more sphincters which are gonna help with that. We've got the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. Now, why have two of those, you might ask? Well, one is gonna be voluntarily controlled and one will be involuntarily controlled. The one that's voluntarily controlled, that's the one that you can consciously sort of think about and tell it to stay closed. That one's really important whenever you like feel like you need to go to the bathroom, but you, you're not in a place where you're able to go to the bathroom at the moment. So you're gonna actively work to keep that feces in you're using your external anal sphincter. But then at other times, there might be feces in your rectum, but you don't feel like you have to go use the restroom. That's gonna be your internal anal sphincter, just holding it there. But that one, you don't have to consciously think about to keep it closed. So the internal anal sphincter, that one's involuntarily controlled. You don't have to think about it. And the external anal sphincter, that one's voluntarily controlled. You can consciously control it to, to prevent yourself from going to the bathroom when you're not ready to. So all of this that we've covered so far is the digestive tract. It includes all of the structures that food actually passes through from the time you eat it to the time that you get rid of it out the other end. All of this is connected together sort of like a maze. So one thing I like to do is to trace the path through the body and see that it's just all connected and I can follow along with it. So let's do that real quick. Food's gonna come in through the oral cavity. It's gonna travel past those salivary glands down into the esophagus. It'll travel through the upper esophageal sphincter through the lower esophageal sphincter. It'll be in the stomach, and it's gonna stay in the stomach and get sloshed around in the acid and stuff. It'll pass through the pyloric sphincter, down through the duodenum where it's finishing digestion or breaking the food down, down into our small intestine, and it's gonna be a long small intestine so that we can maximize the um, absorption of nutrients from our food. Then it'll enter into the cecum of the large intestine. It'll travel up through the ascending colon the transverse colon, the descending colon. During all that time, it's gonna be removing water, absorbing that water into the bloodstream. Then that's gonna travel through the sigmoid colon into the rectum. It'll travel through the internal sphincter and the external anal sphincter, and then out the anus at the other end. So everything there is connected, and these are all of the structures that the food passes through. But we have a few other organs that we need to talk about that are part of the digestive system but they're not part of the digestive tract itself. In other words, food doesn't pass through these, but they're important for the digestion or breaking down of food. The first of those digestive organs is the liver. The liver is one of the biggest organs in the body, and it's gonna make this digestive substance called bile that's really gonna help us to break down fats that we eat. Just inferior to the liver is the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is this little sac that's gonna hold the bile, which is that substance that the liver makes, so that whenever we eat a fatty meal, we've got a bunch of bile ready to eject into it to help break down that fat. So that's the gallbladder right there, but they're connected to each other, and they're connected to each other through something called the bile duct, which makes sense. Bile will travel from the liver into the gallbladder through that bile duct. Here it's connected to the liver, and the bile can travel down and be stored in the gallbladder right there. And then whenever we're ready for that bile to enter into our digestive tract to help us break down fat, that bile will be ejected out through this tube, the bile duct, down and then into the duodenum, where it's going to mix with the foods that we've eaten. So again, we have the liver, we have the gallbladder, and then we have the bile duct, which connects all of those structures to the duodenum. Now there's another branch off the bile duct, which is gonna to connect to our pancreas. 
Now our pancreas, you might remember, is part of the endocrine system, so it's going to make hormones to help us regulate our blood sugar, but it has a second really important function in the digestive tract, which is making digestive enzymes, and those enzymes are going to get dumped out into the duodenum, just like that bile is. So here's our pancreas that's going to make a bunch of enzymes to break down food. Here is the pancreatic duct. It'll connect to the bile duct and then connect to the duodenum. So all of those enzymes will get dumped into the duodenum of the small intestine. All right, now we're going to jump to Terry and take a look at the three-dimensional positioning of a lot of these things. And then at the end, you'll have a chance to see if you can label all of these from memory before we go. All right, so we've got Terry the torso model here. Let's take a look. We've got the oral cavity right there. And we're gonna have these three salivary glands. We've got the sublingual gland right here. If we turn Terry and look under here, we've got the submandibular gland, of course, because this is the mandle of the jawbone. Submandibular is right under that. And then over here, we have the parotid gland. And of course, this is on both sides. We just see on this side because of the cutout here. And all three of those are gonna connect to the oral cavity so that we can produce saliva. All right, so whenever Terry swallows food, that food's gonna travel down the esophagus which we can't see until we get down in here. This, of course, is the trachea, but if I remove the trachea, we can see the esophagus. That's gonna travel down through the diaphragm, which we can see right there. This is the liver, of course. That liver is a pretty big organ. Also take note of where the ribs are. The ribs kind of go down to here, so your liver is kind of up under the ribs. Your lungs are above that. Here's your diaphragm. Your stomach is also just underneath your ribs on the left side. If you'll notice, there's that uh, green sac right there. That's the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is kind of tucked up underneath the liver right there. So let's remove the liver. And then back in there, that's going to be connected to the esophagus right there. So that's the end of the esophagus. That's where that lower esophageal sphincter will be. And then we've got the stomach here, which is very muscular. Um, we're going to take that stomach out, but you'll notice here is the other end of the stomach which is gonna to connect to the duodenum of the small intestine. So here's the beginning of the duodenum. And then right down in here, you can see this little hole right there. That's where the bile duct is gonna connect. We also have the pancreatic duct that's going through the pancreas. So this is all the pancreas right here. We didn't draw this in our diagram, but this is the spleen in purple over here. And then here's part of that bile duct you can see in green right there that's gonna connect up to the gallbladder, which I just removed. Now that duodenum of the small intestine is gonna go down, it's gonna wrap around here, and it'll connect right there, and then it'll travel through all throughout the small intestine right here. And then once we get down over here, here's the cecum or the beginning of the large intestine. You can see where that small intestine connects to the cecum. Down right there will be the entrance to the appendix. And then here we have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. So you can see kind of the sigmoid colon where it makes the S shape right there and then feces will travel out through the bottom there and then out through the anus, which will be at the end of that tube. Let's do a quick recap of all of these structures. Food's gonna travel in through the mouth or the oral cavity. We'll swallow that food, it'll pass by the salivary glands. It's gonna pass through the upper esophageal sphincter into the esophagus, down through the lower esophageal sphincter into the stomach. From the stomach, it'll pass through the pyloric sphincter down into the duodenum of the small intestine. The liver and the gallbladder are both going to be connected to the duodenum via the bile duct, which also connects to the pancreatic duct and into the pancreas. All of that will connect to the duodenum right here. And of course, the liver is making bile, the gallbladder is storing bile, the pancreas is making a bunch of digestive enzymes. All of that gets dumped in the duodenum to help us continue breaking down food. The food's going to pass through the small intestine. We're going to absorb nutrients from that food. Once it gets to the end of the small intestine, It'll join into the colon or the large intestine where water is going to get absorbed. The food will travel up through the ascending and then through the transverse and then the descending and the sigmoid colon. It'll pass into the rectum and then through the internal and external anal sphincters to the outside of the body. All right, take a moment, pause the video, see if you can identify all of the structures of the digestive tract in this diagram. And here are all those structures again, so you can check your answers. Where's your stomach? Where's your stomach? What about your mouth? Where's your mouth? Yeah, very good. Where's your esophagus? <laughs> Where are your intestines at?